Okay, let's get started. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us tonight. My name is Colleen and I am an adult services librarian at the Aurora Public Library District. I'm just gonna take care of a few housekeeping items and then we'll get started. So I just wanna remind everyone, uh, first of all, that we are, um, that the library is open um, by appointment for curbside pickup um, for computer use and for browse and go appointments. Um, and then I just wanna mention some programs that we have coming up, um, they're virtual programs. So tomorrow we have a, program. It's an information session on the COVID vaccine, and it's going to be presented by King County Health Department. Um, so we'll have an English session from six to seven, and then a, a session in Spanish from um, seven to eight. And then at the end of the month, we'll have a documentary film screening of The Long Shadow. Um, and so you'll be able to stream that um, between February 19th and 26th. And then we're going to have a, a live online um, conversation and Q&A with the director. And that'll be on uh, February 24th at 7. Um, and then a program I'm excited about, um, we're having a fireside chat with Dr. Eve L. Ewing on Monday, March 1st at 6. Um, and Ewing is a Chicago-based sociologist of education. And her research focuses on racism, social inequality, and urban policy. And then we'll also be discussing her book, 1919, which is on the Chicago race riots. Um, and that discussion is going to be on Monday, March 8th at 10 a.m. Um, and then last but not least, I want to mention we are having another gardening program a month from today on my Tuesday. <laughs> it's Tuesday. Tuesday, March 9th at 7. Um, and that's uh, with Leah and Sue as well, our master gardeners from University of Illinois Extension. Um, and it's called Planning and Planting a Vegetable Garden. And so all of those you can, except the documentary screening, you can register for all of those online on our events page. Um, and just another quick reminder that we are recording uh, this presentation and it'll be available later on the library's YouTube channel. Um, and I just want to say real quick, and then I'll hand it off, that we are going to um, stop every so often for questions, um, but you can type them into the chat at any time. Um, so thank you so much, Leah and Sue, for being here, and I'll go ahead and let you introduce yourselves. Well, good evening. Um, we're excited to be here. Sue, I, I'm Leah Back. I'm a Master Gardener uh, through the University of Illinois, King County. Um, along with Sue. So I'm Leah. Hi, yes. I'm Sue. And uh, we do this program. We like, we've done this program at the Aurora Library in the past, and we really like doing this program. Um, so we've adapted it to do on uh, Zoom and to do this way. So, um, you know, when we're doing this face to face, we like to have a lot of interaction and a lot of questions. And, you know, people just chime in. Um, as we're going through, I think maybe for tonight's format, it would be best if you would enter your questions in a chat or we'll take breaks throughout the presentation um, to get your questions. And, um, you know, as you go, as we're going through here, you know, we're going to give you two different perspectives of how to start seeds and how to um, use seeds in your garden. But um, Sue and I, we both have gardens, we both have yields and produce from our gardens, but we do things differently in a lot of ways. And we'll kind of point that out as we're going through here that, you know, we, there's more than one way to do it, but here's some general guidelines, you know, for you as you get started. So Sue, I don't know if you had anything else to add before we get started or not. Well, all I have to say is that uh, you'll have to excuse me if I can't get to the chat box fast because uh, I am <clears throat> seem to not be able to run the slideshow and look at the chat box at the same time. <laughs> So I think the questions will have to be answered when we get to the part that says questions. Okay. So with that, I think we're uh, ready to, to kick in. So um, we're going to be talking about, you know, starting plants from seeds. And we'll be taking a perspective of both from um, seeds that you plant directly into the ground 
or if you wanted to plant seeds indoors, you know, starting real soon here and have seedlings to transplant out into your garden. So it's really, you know, what you need to do that are really basic things. You know, it's just seeds, a few minor um, materials, many of which you can find around the house and you'll have your plants to uh, produce items. We're primarily gonna be focusing on herbs, vegetables and flowers. Um, if you wanna do natives and you're interested in, in seeding natives, which is really interesting and it's, you know, um, really recommended that you do start a lot of your natives from seed. They require uh, some different techniques and a few different extra processes in the seed. So we're not gonna touch on that tonight. Primarily just vegetables, herbs, and flowers. Okay, Sue. So why start seeds? I mean, you might be thinking to yourself, you know, why do I wanna start seeds? Um, certainly, you know, when you buy a pack of seeds for $2.99 or $3.99, it's a lot less money than if you went to buy a plant at a store for like $4.99. Um, but really, you do save some money when you start from seed, but really overall in your garden, you're probably not going to be saving a ton of money. But it does, it does save some cost, particularly if you save your seeds at the end of the season. And then the following year, you have your own seed that you've produced and grown. So, you know, substantially... Um, you can save some money that way. Um, another really nice reason to grow your own um, plants is because you know your own growing conditions. You know your own inputs. You'll know, you'll know whether or not there's been pesticides used on your plants. You'll know whether or not if there's been any fertilizers. You, know, you can control the growing conditions of your transplants. So that's really nice to do. Um, and you can get all kinds of different unusual varieties. If you um, start from seed, your options and selections for different types of tomatoes, you know, peppers, you name it, flowers, you're going to have so much more to choose from if you choose from seed than if you were to go to a store and just purchase from the selection that a store might have. You know, they might have 10 different types of tomatoes, but if you grow from seed, you might have an option of 150 different types of tomatoes to choose from. So it's a lot, you get a lot more unusual um, varieties. Okay, Sue. So, so you want to buy seed. You know, what do you have to know when you're going to buy seed? I mean, most importantly, um, you know, we in Kane County, um, in our growing zone, our USDA growing zone, we're zone 5B. So that's significant when you're trying to look at plants that may or may not be um, frost tolerant or may, you know, to know what they can handle in terms of cold or within our number of growing days, will that even mature um, in our number of growing days? So I'm, I'm, we're in zone 5B and technically, as an example, I, you know, we probably shouldn't be able to grow sweet potatoes in our zone, growing zone because we just don't have enough warm temperatures in the summer had uh, long enough of a growing season for sweet potatoes. But as you'll see in a slide that Sue's gonna show a little bit later on, with climate change, our growing season is getting a little bit longer. Our frost dates are, you know, they're getting, our last fr frost date is getting, you know, pushed on either end. So like this year, I'm gonna try to grow sweet potatoes, even though technically we probably really shouldn't be able to have a whole lot of success with sweet potatoes, at least all, you know, the, the varieties in this area. So I'm gonna push it, it's a bit of an experiment, but you know, if they don't work out, I'll know, well, I'm in the wrong growing zone and I shouldn't probably be trying to grow the sweet potatoes in their zone. So um, know, you know, know where we're at when you're selecting your seed. And you, know, you can find things in um, your local garden centers that are very unique. You know, the tomatoes in this, you know, this is a um, black crim tomato, that's basil on the right, you know, it's a purple basil. Over to the left is a type of winter squash. Very unusual um, you know, items that you can grow uh, versus if you were just growing, going to purchase at the grocery store or purchasing plants at a, a nursery or a big box or something like that. So next slide, Sue. So when you go to look for seed, you're gonna find a couple different identifiers on a seed pack. And I just wanna start by saying, all seed packs look different. Um, 
some information will probably be on almost every seed pack you see, but other seed packs have more details than some others. I mean, they're not necessarily consistent. But typically, you will always find on a seed pack whether that seed is open pollinated, whether it's an heirloom, or whether it's a hybrid or an F1. So let's go through that. So on the left, this is an example of a seed catalog. And if you look at the description for the old German tomato, um, right at, in the beginning in parentheses, it says OP. That's an indication that that's an open pollinated seed. And what open pollinated means is that the, uh, the, the, these plants are pollinated through wind and insects. Um, it's really important to know if you want to save seeds. If you're interested in saving your tomato seed from one year to another, you're going to want to make sure you're growing open pollinated. And that's because open pollinated seed, the seed will produce true to its parents. So if you grow an old German tomato this year and you save the seed, you can expect that next year the tomato you will grow will look very, very similar to the to the one that you grew in the year previous. That's different from if you were gonna save a hybrid seed. So over to the right, you'll see uh, on the seed pack F1 highlighted in the blue circle, that F1. And that's an indication that it's a hybrid. You'll see F1 hybrid seed. That seed is just what it says, it's a hybrid. It's been crossed with two different types um, of plants so that it will produce a desirable characteristic. So it's like, so that seed, so you have, you know, it's been crossbred and this is where breeders select for what they want to crossbreed for. So maybe they want to select the characteristic for it matures early, or maybe they want to select for a characteristic that it gets to be a very big fruit. Or maybe they want to select off of colors. I mean, there's a, or maybe some kind of disease resistance. There's, you know, endless different types of attributes or characteristics that breeders want to find in a seed. So they'll, they'll cross breed two different types of plants to get that characteristic. And if you save your seed from an F1 plant or a hybrid plant to grow out next year, you know, it's highly likely you aren't going to get a fruit that is like its parents. So if they selected for a plant on size, maybe next year you would get a plant that's significantly bigger and might not taste as good. So um, for seed saving, if you want to seed save, make sure you always get open pollinated, not the hybrids. Um, hybrids, you know, there's, there's advantages to hybrids though. I mean, hybrids have um, a lot of disease, you know, they're, they're many seeds of the hybrids will have a disease resistance bred into it that you won't find that always in open pollinated. They don't have a lot of disease resistance. So perhaps, you know, you might want to grow uh, an F1 or a hybrid seed because you want to um, guard against different diseases or um, particularly in tomatoes and different plants as well. So just be checking your package to see and know what your intentions are. If you intend to save seed, make sure you get open pollinated. And um, if there's a certain disease that's a concern of you, you know, maybe you want to kind of keep your eye on the F1s or the hybrids. And you can find seed, all, I mean, lots of places. You know, you can, uh, Aurora Library had a seed last weekend, right, where you could sign up for some seed. Um, and under a non-COVID year, I know that the library has a seed swap at the end of January, which is Nat National Seed Swap Day. And it's really a lovely for the assortment of seeds that are available for the community and you can take seed there. Um, you can get your seed from seed that have large variety, large assortment, lots of descriptions. Um, you can find seed at nurseries or big box stores. So when you get your seed, um, you'll want exactly the same, but there should be a date on seed pack. And um, when you have that seed, when you have that um, date on there, I just got a, a, co a, a connectivity error. So hopefully I don't freeze up on you here. Um, there'll be, diff you can use that seed for more years. So for example, looking at this chart, if you have a cucumber seed 
that seed should be good for five years. Contrast that to the very bottom. If you have an onion seed, that seed's probably only good for one year. So if you have some seeds sitting around the house, maybe you know now's a good time to go through your seed and see you know when does what is the date on it and is that a seed that I can use for even though it's been expired for two or three years. Um, you know, a little bit of a note on that seed pack, it's kind of like food. You know how they tell you, um, you'll see a food expiration date on a can of food or a package of food. And sometimes, you know, you can eat that beyond that date. It's okay, depending on what it is, you use your judgment. It's kind of the same way with seeds. Um, for example, lettuce, it says it only is good for one year, but you know it's highly likely that you'll have your lettuce seeds that will be viable seeds for probably two to three years. You may get less of the seed that germinates, so you might not get 100% germination. There might be a reduced bit of germination on older seed, but it's likely that you will have some success with that. And you can always, if you want to do a little trial before you you know, do the big thing and plant your seeds in, in your garden, you can always do a seed germination test. So um, check your seed. I think, Sue, didn't you have some tomato seeds that were 20 years old once? 25 years old. 25 year old tomato seed. And, and you they see were here, fine, 90% germination. So she got 90% germination. And, you know, this tells us tomato seeds should only last four years. So this is guidance, use this as a guidance, you know, it is a good idea if you have old seed, just you know, do a, a, a test to see that it is okay. So um, for the rest of our talk tonight, we're gonna be talking about um, how you, considerations for if you want a direct seed, which when we say direct seed, we mean plant directly into the ground versus if we want to plant on indoor seedlings and start our plants indoors and plant them out. So some seeds do best when they're planted directly in the ground. Um, examples of those are beans and beets, carrots, peas, radishes. Um, but other plants um, you want to do indoors, particularly in our area, because you need, we have, they take a long growing season and they need warmth. So things like tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, they do best if you start those indoors. And then there's other things that it doesn't matter whether you're inside or whether you're outside. So some of your greens, like that would be kale or squashes, you can do either. And before we move on, I saw a question pop up that how do you do a seed germination test? Um, this is one of the things when we do this face-to-face, -face, um, uh, Sue and I, we, we have an example of how you do that. But what you can do simply is take like 10 seeds or maybe five seeds, depends on how much seed you have. If you can spare 10, use 10 seeds, or, but if not, use five and put, lay them out on a damp cloth or paper towel. Not totally wet, just lightly damp. Fold that over so that the seeds are covered with this damp cloth and stick that into a Ziploc bag. <clears throat> Don't close the Ziploc bag, but just you know, stick it to, on a warm spot in your kitchen somewhere on top of your refrigerator maybe, or you know, near your dishwasher if your dishwasher gets warm when it runs. And leave it there for a few days. And after you know a few days, open it up to see if any of the seeds have germinated. Now, depending on what type of seed you are trying to germinate, some germinate quicker than others. So you might have to leave it for a while. Like I will germinate peas that way. And sometimes it takes seven or eight days for my peas to germinate. But other seeds might germinate quicker. So just keep on checking on it every day after a few days to see if any of the seeds are germinating. And you'll know because there'll be a little swiggly thing coming out of the seed. And um, so let's say you put five, let's just go simplicity. Uh, let's say you put 10 seeds on your damp towel cloth um, and you got seven of them have germinated. That means you've got seed that's got a 70% germination rate. Seven of 10 would equate to 70%. So that's a way to test your seed. Um, and you can do that tonight when we get off here. If you have seed around that you wanna test, just you know, test it that way. So, okay. So we'll move on. Um, Sue, if you wanna to go to the next slide. I'm trying. So um, temperature is important to know. 
when you're going to plant a garden and or when you're going to start your seeds and you know temperature you'll hear temperature in different contexts you'll hear it in terms of air temperature or frost temperature and you'll also maybe some seed packs might tell you based on what your soil temperatures are so you know there's a couple of different things and like i said no two seed packs are the same so some Seed packs might say plant after a chance, after the last frost, when there's no chance of frost. If that's the case, you'll look at our freeze dates. And this, this chart on the top is um, data updated through 2020. And if you look at um, in the spring, our last fall date, this is a median, but in general, our last frost date in Kane County, in Aurora, this is in Aurora, is April 25th. Um, that has moved up a couple of days from where it was in 2010, which was April 27th. And then in the fall, our first frost date um, is October 17th, which it used to be October 10th. So, you know, we've extended our growing days a little bit in the last 10 years by, um, call it, you know, a uh, week and two days. So um, that's how you can check your frost dates. But again, this is just guidance. If you've got tomatoes, you know, kind of look at your forecast and kind of know if you're going to be having a frost, you definitely don't want to put those tomatoes in the ground. Um, and some other plants might say based on what your soil temperatures are. So you can check soil temperatures, you know, you can just use, um, a, this is a meat thermometer in this example at the bottom of the picture, but like cool season crops are an example of that. Cool season crops, things such as kale, lettuce, spinach, that can all be planted before a frost, before our last frost. And generally they might say when the soil warms or the seed pack might say when, to, uh, when the soil can be worked, um, but generally that's around 50 degrees. So when your soil gets 50 degrees. Um, warm season crops, things like tomatoes, eggplant, squashes, basil, um, that's around 65 to 75 degrees. So look at your seed packs uh, and see what they specify. So you might be thinking like, what's our soil temperatures today? You know, what is our current soil temperature? So um, I did something um, last week, last Thursday, was that it was the last day that we had like above freezing temperatures. It was 32 degrees that day. And I thought, I wonder what our soil temperature is today. So I went to this website, it's um, through the University of Illinois that will give you the soil temperature. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see last Thursday before we've had these days of, you know, sub zero nights and very, very cold weather, um, our soil temperature was about, uh, at two inches, it was 32.5, uh, at four inches, it was 33.9. That's on bare soil. So then I went in earlier this afternoon or this morning and checked what our soil temperatures are today because it's a heck of a lot colder than it was last Thursday. And we've had since last Thursday, really cold weather. And I wanted to see what impact that had on the soil temperatures. And if you look, you'll see it's really had minor impact on our soil temperatures a little bit on the sod. So if you look at sod, that got a little bit colder and went from, you know, dropped, you know, four tenths of a degree. Um, but this, I wanted to point out to you that sometimes air temperature, you can't just pay attention to what the air temperature is. You do want to look at the soil temperature. And part of the reason our soil temperatures are so warm today, which you would think it would be really cold when our, you know, it was six degrees when I did this, this reading, um, is we have so much snow. Snow insulates uh, the ground and plants. And so that snow base has really insulated our soil temperatures, which is good. You know, that's a nice thing to have. So our, our soil is much warmer than you would expect it to be on a day like today. So the takeaway is just make sure um, you're following your package guidelines um, and you know, pay attention to what the soil recommendations, temperature recommendations are. So, um, so when you're thinking about dates and you're thinking about when does stuff get planted, you know, you can go crazy. Here's, this is where Sue and I, you know, Sue will call herself 
she has one method of planning and I have another method of planning. And mine is like, you know, I love Excel spreadsheets. So like, you know, everything I can put on Excel spreadsheets, perfect for me. So this is just kind of a timeline of when I start my seedlings. So you'll see my rosemary. I generally start that, like I started mine last week, January 26th. Uh, and then the, if you follow the, the green line over April 26th, that's when I plant it out. This is again, just guidance. I always pay attention to what that year is doing and what the temperatures and the frost is looking like in that particular year. But this is just kind of a general guidance of how do I get my head around when I have to start things and when do I transplant them? So this is like, you know, this is, um, my method, which is some find a little bit excessive, like Sue finds this excessive. So if you want to go to the next slide, here's how Sue plans out her garden. Okay. So she would just, you want to talk to it, Sue? Oh, there's not much to say. I just scratch out something on a piece of paper. I know that which things need to be planted four to six weeks before the last frost, two to four weeks before, uh, and at the last frost and after. So I just kind of write that out and then I look on the calendar and see, well, it would be around these dates I should do it. So find a method that works for you, however you like to do it. And, um, you know, just, but do give it some thought about how soon you need to plant something out and pay attention to the seed pack when it tells you, like it might say, start four to six weeks before the last frost. And then you just back up from that. Okay, Sue. All right, so questions. The only way I'm gonna see these is I have to stop sharing the screen, so. I can see them, Sue. Well. I think. Uh -oh. um, can well, you start can... your plastic jugs outside in this weather? Um, I think you mean maybe for like um, perennials and if you're doing natives, you could start in plastic jugs outside the, in this type of year. Um, if you're doing tomatoes, I don't think you'd have much luck. Tomato or more. No, but I think some people start lettuces even like this, but I think it's a little early. Uh, native seeds, yeah, uh, I have some that are outside. They need uh, 30 to 60 days of cold, so they're they're out. But I wouldn't do too many other things. And someone made a comment here, beans will go wild if you start them inside. Yeah, beans are something that don't require you to start inside. Um, it's certainly, um, you know, if you plant them directly outside, you'll have enough uh, growing time to, to do that. So, um, okay. so okay. any other questions, we'll move on. Let me get back to um, sharing. So direct seeding, um, there's considerations, you know, you want to think about, this is all about if you're going to plant directly, when you plant directly in the ground. So you want to think about temperature, um, your lighting requirements, what has to happen to the soil, what's my spacing, uh, moisture and thinning. So we're going to cover those environments those right now. There, okay. So um, in lighting, know your environment. Um, if you're not, you know, if, you, if you're starting a new garden or even if you've had a garden, just make sure you know how much sunlight your garden is getting a day. Um, and the way you can follow, whoops, Sorry. follow your uh, light is follow the sun on your garden between 10 and 5, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. to determine, determine when your garden is getting full sun. Now the sun's gonna change over the coming weeks and months. Um, so you want to do that a little bit closer to uh, planting time, but, you know, follow the sun and ideally you've got sun between 10 and 5 um, on your garden. And the lighting requirements, so for fruiting plants, things like peppers, tomatoes, eggplants, etc., you're going to need 8 to 10 hours of sun. Um, and then for plants that are leafy, um, so kale, lettuces, um, spinach, six to eight hours of uh, sun is required. Um, is your soil ready to be planted in? 
Um, you know, if you've got a new bed and you don't, and you're questioning um, if your soil has proper nutrients and proper organic matter, you can always do a soil test. And if you necessary, you amend it. Um, is it the right moisture? You don't want to ever plant when it's too wet and you don't want to plant when it's too dry. Um, and do you need to loosen your soil versus are you going no-till? Um, if, if I use no-till, so I never um, till my soil and I don't disturb my soil. Um, I try to preserve the microorganisms, microorganisms and the soil structure that's in place. And I don't ever really want to even turn my soil over. Um, and that's one method of gardening. But um, you know, another one is if you, if you do till your garden, you know, make sure that you do it at the right time, not when it's too wet, because then you're going to have compacted soil. And if it's too dry, you're not going to have good soil structure either. So um, we, we need to know that the soil is ready and prepared. So your spacing, um, again, look at your seed pack and most seed packs will have this information. This seed pack for this melon, as an example, says to plant seeds per group in a hill. So they're saying you want to hill your beds. So hilling, if you can tell in this picture, is just mounding up some soil and putting your seeds on it. That's one method of planting. Um, but each plant has a unique uh, requirement for planting. So if we go to the next slide, some might say that they need to be planted in rows. Um, or maybe you're going to broadcast your seed, which is just scatter your seed um, and let it kind of grow in random locations. So know what you need to do. If you're gonna be planting in rows, make sure you make your furrows, space it out and follow the package directions. I know it's so tempting when those seeds are so tiny and you think, oh, there's no way I have to put an, these seeds two inches apart or one inch apart. It's so tiny, do it. <laughs> do what the package says, because otherwise you're gonna be spending your time just thinning things out after they mature. So follow the guidelines on spacing, and that means spacing between the seeds within a row, but also spacing between the rows. And then cover your seeds with soil. Um, again, based on what the package says, it might say a quarter of an inch, it might say an inch, and then cover the seed with the soil and lightly, um, firmly press it in, but don't compact your soil. So what you wanna do is make sure that you have good soil to seed contact. So that's why you're putting the soil back on that is to get good contact so that the, the seed can make contact with the soil. All right, so again, moisture, you know, we don't want it too wet. We don't want it too dry. It's like Goldilocks, we want it just right. Um, the soil should hold together nicely but not be all muddy and yucky and it shouldn't be dry and crumbly. So uh, if we don't have, if we have too much water, you know, uh, our seeds need, the soil needs oxygen for the seeds to grow. Um, so, you know, uh, that's gonna be bad. And if it's too dry, um, our seed isn't going to have the moisture that it needs to germinate. And then after your seedlings germinate, if you have, um, Seedlings that are too close, make sure you want to thin those out to give them space to grow. This was a mistake I always used to make in my early years of gardening. I never had the heart to thin them out. I thought how they looked so, you know, they looked innocent. <laughs> how could I thin these seedlings out? But truly once I did pay more attention to thinning out my seedlings, my garden did so much more improved significantly because I actually gave the plant room to grow and to mature. So when you are doing your seedlings though, I really recommend that you use a small scissors. If you just pinch it out, which is tempting to do, um, because they're so close, you might disrupt the roots of a neighbor uh, seedling and then that seedling might not make it. So it's too disruptive to all those little tiny roots that are in there. When you when you pull them pull them out, so just take a little scissors to thin your seedlings. So we're done with direct seeding. Are there questions, comments, anything on direct seeding you want to hear more about or talk about? Does 
Like Tess has a question. Like this. Oh, okay. Hi, can you hear me? I can. Hi. Hi. Okay. So I am, I, I learned the hard way about, um, starting beans way too early. Um, and I started my whole garden way too early last season. I think it was my first time. Uh, and I was antsy to start everything inside, but with doing beans direct outside, how do you know how moist the soil is supposed to be like do you, uh, you know I didn't think about what you just said about the oxygen needing to come in contact with it in the soil so how do you know if you're over watering or if you're under watering when they're still so tiny well if you're watering I don't think if your question is when to water I would um you know I would use a principle of especially when they're seedlings you know you want it to be moist um but you don't want it to be sopping wet okay. um, and you don't want it to dry out either so it's kind of a fine line you know when I have little seedlings it depends if we have a wet spring when I plant my beans there's been years where I've not had to water my beans at all mm -hmm. um because they you know we've had enough rain and enough moisture to keep it in um a, a nice test is to stick your finger down and if you can stick your finger down an inch and feel moisture um then that's good um, but if you stick your finger down into the soil and you don't feel any moisture, then it's probably time to water. Okay. Um, you know, I've had, I remember, a, I think it was two years ago, I had planted all my beans and we had, uh, we had so much rain. I think it was two years ago. And I looked out at my garden and that whole area where my beans were was just kind of standing in water. Um, and I thought, oh man, I'm, you know, these, this is all going to be lost. And sure enough, everything was fine. So, um, I mean, plants and seeds can be resilient. We don't want to intentionally do things that are wrong. Um, but I think they can, they can be resilient, but in terms of you controlling the water, just if you want to know when you should water, stick your finger down a, an inch into the soil to feel for moisture. Anything to add to that, Sue? No, that pretty much covers it. Are there other questions? Um, oh, at what point in the season do you recommend doing a soil test? Um, if prior to planting, what month? Um, I have always done mine in the spring and I do the soil um, as soon as I can dig it up. So um, each soil test has specific direction on how to get your sample, but most of them would require that you'd go probably six to eight inches down into your soil to get your sample. So, and, you know, if ground's frozen, you might not be able to do that for a while, but, you know, I'd say in March, if you can get in and do that in March, it's great, or early April and get your soil tested, then that'll give you time to amend it uh, with whatever your results come back. So if you come back with, you know, that you have a deficiency in some area, that'll give you time to address it before the growing season. So I'd say as soon as you can, um, you know, dig six to eight inches into your soil is a good time to do it. And uh, we recommend uh, the King County Farm Bureau because they're pretty reasonable and you can go on their website and get all the information because I think they have three different levels of soil tests. So you can just get a basic one and one with all these micronutrients. So uh, take a look at their website, King County Farm Bureau. Anything else come up? I don't see anything. Okay, shall we move on? Yes. Okay, so you could stick a tomato seed in the ground in May and you'd get a plant and maybe even a couple of tomatoes, but you sure wouldn't get very much. So this next, next section, we're gonna talk about starting seeds indoors so that you can extend the, the growing season and be able to get some vegetables. So the main thing you need to ask yourself is, do you have the time to spend on this, which you will be spending sometimes as early as January until even May, and do you have the space? So this picture shows someone who 
apparently thinks that they have the space. So you have to be able to provide the appropriate conditions to germinate your seeds and grow them to be a few inches tall. So if you're starting indoors, you're going to need a few things. Uh, calendar for counting backwards, permanent marker and labels. Uh, it's really important to label your seeds. I label mine and last year I had an accident where I dropped a tray of tomato and pepper seeds and they went out of their containers. So I had a big mess and I was able to salvage them, but I could tell tomatoes from peppers, but I couldn't tell tomato types apart. So I had a few surprises in the garden. So be sure that you la always label your, your um, plants. Uh, light source, I'm gonna talk a bit about light uh, containers and seed starting mix as well. So uh, these are just your basics. So light, light is something that, that can be pretty confusing. Um, you could uh, just buy a setup from a, a reputable growing source, but you're still eventually going to need to replace the bulbs. So it, it is important to learn a little bit about bulbs. So generally for the home gardeners, it's recommended you choose either a fluorescent or an LED bulb. Now, the problem with LED right now is that a lot of research hasn't been done yet for the home gardener. So you would need to rely a lot on what your supplier says uh, about specifics for timing and height. And I'll, I'll get into that in a moment. And you may be asking, well, why can't we just use sunlight? And maybe you have done some sun growing in a window in winter to start seeds. And yeah, it can be done. But generally, if you're just going to rely on the sunlight in winter from a window, you're going to get what we call leggy, stretched out um, seedlings. They're going to be weaker. They're going to take a lot more effort to be prepared to go outside in the spring. And you are probably not going to get as much yield from them as you would if you used artificial light. So fluorescents have been around a lot longer and they're, they're generally pretty economical. Although the LEDs as well are coming down in price. So um, right now the latest type of fluorescent is called a T5, but you can find ones called T8 and T12. And those are just the diameter of that long uh, tube. Uh, you can go as simple as buying a shop light fixture and putting in, in a tube, uh, or you can go fancier again with buying some type of a setup. You can also retrofit fluorescent shop light fixtures with LEDs. Um, so the LEDs generally produce less heat, which may or may not be a benefit. If you're growing in a cold basement, you may want fluorescent because it has some heat to heat up the area. LEDs also consume little power and they have longer lives and they, they do have a bit more light intensity. So this year, I know Leah is trying LEDs and I also bought a set of LEDs so we can't report on how those work just yet, but uh, do you have anything to say yet about your LEDs, Leah? Well, I do know that um, I'm growing microgreens right now under them. And, and, and I have, my basement is really cold. It's like 52 degrees down there. And um, I do have the microgreens on a heat map, but I think that they're not getting as much heat from the LEDs that they were getting from the fluorescence. So, you know, just a consideration if you are growing in a cold space, those fluorescent bulbs um, have a nice incremental benefit of putting out some heat for, for your seedlings as well. Yeah. Okay. And That's I don't good. I don't know good. enough yet that the LEDs, if anything's growing better, less uh, not growing faster or anything. You haven't noticed anything like that. Okay. Yeah, Leah, can you monitor for questions as well? Sure. While we're, we're going through this. Okay, I think we addressed that. So now we got to talk a little bit about light. So you know about the spectrum and that all those colors make white light. 
but what you might not know is that there's something called photosynthetically active radiation or PAR for short. And that's the wavelengths of light or the colors of light that plants use for growth. And those happen to be red and blue light. So um, you just have to make sure that when you're growing with artificial light, that you, whether it's fluorescent or it's LED, that you are getting enough of the proper type of light. So you think, well, I can just buy any kind of, um, you know, I'll just buy some tube at, you know, Menards or someplace, but it doesn't really work like that. You have to pay attention to light color on a white tube. And this is where it starts to get confusing. So when you have a fluorescent or even an LED light, they can range in color from being in the reddish range all the way to the bluish, bluish range. And color is really a measure of the color temperature measured in Kelvin. So if you remember from chemistry class, that's just you know one type of a um, temperature scale. So if you look over here, we have the lowest range is going to be your reddish, and that's about 1500 K, all the way up to 8000 K, which is your in your blue range. So remember that the plants like blue and red. So you definitely need a white light that puts out blue. So you that would be a cool white light, and that would be the 5,000 to 6,500 K light bulb. So you have to actually look at the bulb and look at the K number. So that's a cool white. You can just get germination with, a, with blue light only, but a red light is uh, recommended to mix into that because red is going to keep the plants shorter and sturdier while they're starting to grow. So for a red light, you need a bulb that's considered soft white, and that's in the 2700 to 3000 K range. So if you get, say, a red and a blue, if your, your um, setup holds two bulbs, you're okay. Now, Leah, you had your setup holds three bulbs. Is that correct? Yes. So you got what, two blues and one red? Yes. Is that what you did? Right. So, so that's something that you, you want to do is make sure you're getting the red and the blue. So you might say, how about full spectrum? If you look on the bottom, that is a picture of, that's my bulb. Uh, those are my new bulbs that I got and they're considered full spectrum, but you have to be sure if you get a full spectrum bulb that you're getting a full spectrum bulb that has enough in the blue and enough in the red. And you can see this one does. So, uh, it's, it's considered more of a, a full spectrum grow light, but you have to, if you just buy full spectrum off of the shelf, you, you have to do a little research into that to make sure you're getting enough blue and red. So the other thing that you can do is you can buy what's known as a grow light, and that's a picture over on the uh, right, and they give off that purplish pink color, and those will have the the blue and the uh, red colors in them in the proper mix for growing. The only downside with a grow light is that they tend to be a little more expensive than the non-grow light, but you are in, ensured that you're getting the proper colors. Okay, so that was about color. Now we have light intensity. And like I said before, the LEDs are, are really new and you're gonna to have to depend on what your, your manufacturer says for height because uh, usually Illinois Extension or in other uh, university extension uh, groups will do research for the home, homeowner. Uh, they're too new for, for a lot of research to have been done yet. So fluorescence, 
recommended to keep them two to three inches above the plants. So if you can see in the picture, those lights are pretty close to the plants. LED, a general recommendation is somewhere between eight and 18 inches. So that's a, a pretty wide range above your plant. You'll know that if they're too close, if your plants start to get kind of a bleached looking, they, they're actually starting to burn from too much light. Uh, so there's a question of where you buy blue and red bulbs. Uh, you can get them just in any um, hardware store. A, a store that has a lot of light, a light bulbs um, would, would have that. I think you can, you can find them in um, your big box store and places like that. They won't actually be that color. They'll be white light, but they'll have that particular Kelvin stamp on them. So they'll be like cool white or soft white. So those are, those are what you want to look for. You, and online as well. So just regular fluorescent lights, but with those Kelvins on them or with the designation of cool for the blue range and uh, what was the other soft for the red range. Okay, so because the LEDs are put off much more intensity, they're higher and they also, the timing of them is going to be, you know, how long you need to leave the light on is going to be different from fluorescent. So for fluorescent, it's recommended generally 14 to 16 hours a day. Uh, LEDs, all we can say at this point is less time. Leah, are you leaving yours on less? Yes, I am. Okay. But they're microgreens, so I wouldn't have them on that long anyway. But I am, yes. Okay. So I'm only having them on for eight hours a day. Okay. So yeah, that's something again with LED. Hopefully your manufacturer tells you something. Uh, maybe, maybe not. So you have you might have to play around with that. Uh, the one thing you, you probably should do with fluorescent lighting is rotate your plants or uh, shift them around because the ends of the tubes don't put out as much light as the center of the tube. Uh, whereas the LEDs are so uh, intense that you probably don't need to rotate the plants. The other, the other thing with, with LEDs, and I, I haven't seen this yet because I haven't used them that long, is there, there is some talk that LED bulbs won't last as long as fluorescent bulbs, but I can't really say more than, you know, a, an extension educator told me that. <laughs> so uh, again, this is all um, kind of up in the air. And you might ask, well, why don't we just leave the light on all the time? And that's because some plants do need the dark, at least several hours of dark in order to be able to grow properly. So uh, it's, it's good to turn them off anyway. Okay, and then this just shows some, some setups. Over on the, on the left, you can see this is more of perhaps a uh, homemade setup. You can just, again, buy a fixture you can hang it from something above, if you're in your basement, from your rafters or for some, some place and with chains so that you can raise and lower, you can have a table. It can be as simple as that and it can be more economical that way. If you buy something that's over on the right, uh, you're gonna start to get into a little more cost because you're getting a nice little setup. The, you can raise and lower the lights with the knobs on the side. Uh, it just depends on how much you uh, want to or are willing to, to pay for your, your setup. So you can look online. There are some good examples of how to make light stands using PVC pipe. Uh, so you can even go in that direction if you, you want. You can, you can buy uh, uh, some of the LEDs uh, come just in one piece and they're very lightweight. You can buy uh, wire shelving and you can attach a bulb to the wire shelving and you can make a setup that way too. So there, it's just uh, depends on 
what you want to spend and how much you want to work at that. Okay, questions. Leah, can you see, any? see anything in the chat? Okay, because I can't, I can't uh, read the chat while I'm running the slides. I didn't. If someone comes that. up, I'll let I'll shout it out. Oh, but, somebody oh, raised a hand. Can you see a question? Uh, Nixa is, uh, we can't hear you, Nixa. I still can't hear you. I will, I will type it out. <laughs> I can almost hear you. Oh, is that better? Better. Okay, I guess we're yelling into this. <laughs> I want to grow herbs indoors. Is that one on the right? Was that a better option for smaller plants? No, not necessarily. Uh, you can get bulbs anywhere from two feet uh, to how how long are yours, Leah? Are they four feet? Four feet. I don't know if they go. They probably do go larger than four feet, but I'm not certain. But I have setups of just two feet because I don't know why. That's just what I started with. So, <laughs> no, you can, you can, um, you, you don't need to have a, a, a fancy, a, a setup like that. Um, let me go back to that. The setup on the right, that's going to cost you probably a couple of hundred dollars. Oh, uh, okay. But the one on the left uh, would probably cost you less than what? 30-ish maybe with the bulbs and and the and the fixture. I, I'm not sure. And then if you have another a way that you hang it up. But yeah, that that's a good thing to do um, indoors. And then when the weather gets nice, you can put them outdoors. So you don't need to do it year okay, round inside. It. Yeah, because I know I keep seeing all the little, the cute little pots that you have indoors for like herbs for like your kitchen. So I know I want something small, but I haven't decided if it's going to go outside yet, but I can't have anything too big because the goal at some point would be have a basement, but currently we are not there yet. <laughs> mm, but you can buy a two foot long light uh, and a fixture okay. and that's, that's not very big and you can find a little place for that. Uh, there are also not just the, the fluorescent tubes, but if you look, you can find more of like a spotlight for a grow light that you can mm -hmm. sit on a table and point at the plants if you don't have very many. So that could be an option as well. Okay, I'll look into that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Any other questions? I don't see any, Sue. Okay, well, if you have questions, you can you know, save them for the end because we're getting, we're getting close. Okay, so other supplies, uh, a fan, you might wonder, why do I need a fan? Well, one thing is there, uh, there's a lot of humidity when you're growing plants and that's a perfect place for some fungus to grow. And some of the fungus can be detrimental to your plants and cause some plant diseases. So keeping the air moving keeps it a little drier around your plants as well as it actually toughens your plants. Uh, the movement strengthens the stems of the plants so that they're able to adapt outside a little bit better. A timer is great because if your setup is in the basement and you've got it running 16 hours, you know, do you wanna be running down twice a day to turn on and turn off the lights and the fan? So that that's kind of a, uh, to me, a no-brainer. Um, containers, it doesn't really matter what you use as long as they have drainage uh, and you have about three to four inches of depth. I am going to say with these types of peat pots here, when you go to transplant outside, it's best to remove the peat pot and go compost it somewhere because the peat pots can't, when you go to water the plant in the ground and it's in the peat pot, it can suck the water away from the roots of the plants. So, and then the poor little plant has to fight to get through that peat pot before the peat pot actually breaks down all the way. So 
eh, get rid of them. Sue, um, we have some questions on the fans. Um, okay. A couple thing is, um, do uh, how long should the fan run for? And how frequently should the fan be turned on? And then another one that says, um, I have tons of mold and mushrooms every time I do seedlings. It's crazy. Do you think a fan would be helpful for oh, this? Oh yeah, definitely. And would you recommend a particular can container for mold or fungus? And then also, and we also have a one on temperature as well, but. Okay, well, and fans, you know, I, I don't run it you know, the 16 hours a day, you know, but it, sometimes it's just easier to run it the 16 hours a day if it's on the same timer with the lights. But you can, you could probably get by with, with less of that. What do you run? Do you run a fan for the whole time the lights are on, Leah? I, no, I only run them for about three or four hours a day. Yeah, right. And there's some days I skip it too, depending, like if my, if my house is really, really dry and sometimes it is, and if I'm growing them upstairs and the heater is on and everything's dry, I may not even use the fan. But when I walk by, I, this is bad. <laughs> I brush my hand over the plants because I want to toughen them. I want them to feel some movement. Uh, so I'm, I'm a big one for running my hands over plants. And I haven't had any trouble with that. Do you ever do that? Yes, I, oh. I brush them and... Yeah. Okay. So it isn't just, just me doing that. <laughs> so I hope, uh, yeah. And if you've had a lot of mold problems, you know, I grow all mine in plastic and I haven't had mold problems. So maybe if you start a fan on them, you won't have that mold problem either. Uh, uh, what about aphids? Um, Chris says she grows spinach, kale, and lettuce. And it's you have aphids I mean, indoors? I'm assuming the aphids are inside or outside. Because I've never heard of them ever being inside. Well, inside. they can be if you have house plants. And that means you've got a source of, of aphids going on in your house and you got to take care of that. Because, um, yeah, outside, I haven't had a problem with aphids. Have you had a problem with that? No, because when I put the spinach out, the, the insects aren't out yet. <laughs> so that's the, the early spring, you know, that the aphids aren't out. Okay, are there some more? There's more questions. There's a question about um, temperature and what's the ideal temperature for starting indoors? And oh, would I you... got, that's coming, that's yeah. coming. Is there, is there anything else? related to so far because I, no. okay so i haven't i haven't talked about um what so we have the container here and then what material do you use and and this may be also a, a source of mold uh uh it's recommended to use a sterile soilless mix not something like garden soil and you know the reason is garden soil isn't sterile and even if you baked it in your oven, it would be, uh, generally our garden soil here is pretty clayey and those little tomato seeds and pepper seeds have to fight against that, that tough material to come up. So a soilless seed starting mix is going to be the right texture and consistency to help your seeds to, to grow the best. And you can make your own and there are plenty of recipes online or you can buy a specific seed starting mix. Up here in the corner, there's a, a square or rectangular package. That's going to be the coconut core. That's just a plain material without any, anything else in it. And that's a good starting mix. Or you can buy uh, a seed starting mix that's labeled as that. And, you know, why that and not potting soil? Well, generally a seed starting mix isn't going to have fertilizer in it, or if it does, it will be very dilute. Potting mix will generally have fertilizer in it, which is way too concentrated for little seedlings. It also has uh, sometimes that gel stuff to help maintain moisture. 
So that's not good because it'll be too wet. And the other thing is if you compare potting mix with seed starter, the potting mix is coarser and has pieces of stuff in it where the seed starting mix is, is pretty uniform and, and nice, you know, it's fine. So, all right, so ask me, have I ever started seeds in potting mix? Sure, <laughs> when I didn't have anything handy, you know, but I try to keep, always have seed starting mix. And I never started things like tomatoes in it. I, you know, it was more for tougher, what I would call a bigger, tougher seed does better in potting mix, but it's best to just use seed starting mix. So, okay. I think that addressed that. And so now that you have all your stuff, it's time to, to start planting. So um, the seed media, if you ever, if you buy it and it's in a bag, it's, it's really very dry and, and you pick up a bag and it's real light. So you need to mix and wet that before you even put it in the container because when you put you'll have a big mess if you put it in your container and then try to wet it so you can put it in a, a bucket or something or I'm lazy I'm I always say I'm the lazy gardener I pour water into the bag of my seed starting mix and stir it around and get that wet and then I put it in my container so uh, you want it to be like a damp sponge, you know, not sopping and not too dry. You'll know like a, when you wring a sponge out and it's, it's just kind of damp. Uh, plant your seeds according to the packet. So again, if it says they need to be laid on top, you put them on top, but you again, make sure they have contact with the soil. Um, yeah, you put two to three seeds in, in your um, little container and yeah you might have to throw out a few it it happens um, sometimes if if it's some some kind of seed that I don't have a lot of and it's rare I'll I'll get a spoon and very gently take that out and I'll separate and then replant those but you have to be real careful generally you just take your scissors and kill them uh, you want to make sure the soil is, you know, kind of pressed down, not too super loose, but not packed. You want to be sure you label and you start off covering uh, initially so that you have humidity. So uh, that helps the seeds to get their best start. So we go back to this germination temperature. Um, you have the warm season crops and they really like the tomato, the pepper, the eggplant, they really like warm temperature. And if you have a basement that's 50 degrees, how on earth do you do that? Well, you need what's called a germination heat mat. So with that, uh, you'll get the right temperature. Yeah, those, those tomatoes would eventually germinate, but it would take forever with a warm mat you get them happening in a, in a reasonable time. The only downside I ever see with the mat is that you have to be watching to, they will dry your, your soil out if you're not going and looking every day to see what's happening because they're on, they're on my timer with my lights and the fan. So they do you know 16 hours of being pretty warm your, your soil can dry out. So you wanna, you wanna check on that. Uh, and it's good to just check on your plants once a day anyway, and the soil moisture as well. So if you have, um, depending on what system you're planting with, you can water using something gentle. So a spray bottle is really great for watering, or you might have a system where you can water from below and there are some like that. So just something that doesn't disrupt the germinating seed and the little seedling when it comes up. And then, so you have that cover on whatever it may be, whether it's saran wrap or you have a system that has a plastic cover over it. 
when about 80% of the plants are sprouted, you take the cover off so that you don't get mold. That's when the fan would be coming on. And as the plants grow, you're going to increase the light height. Uh, and fertilizing, if your seed mix doesn't have uh, a fertilizer in it, uh, when the first true leaves are there, and if we look at that plant in the left-hand corner, the two oval leaves are called the seed leaves. They're not the true leaves. The true leaves are that one in the middle, and that's some type of squash or, or um, cucumber plant there. So when you see that, that's when they need just half strength every other week. So they don't need a whole lot of fertilizer, you'll burn them and kill them. And again, like Leah said, even pinching them, you can accidentally pull on another plant. So get those scissors out and uh, kill them that way. And then you can't just go from having your plants indoors in you know your house where it's not getting i mean the the lights are nowhere near the sun no artificial light has the intensity of the sun so you have to do what's called hardening off you have to prepare them to spend the rest of their time outside and it has to happen slowly so about two weeks before planting and and that will be, depend if you're planting a, if you started a cool crop inside that would You'll be, put, you'll be starting to adapt them in March or April even. If it's a warm crop, you'll probably be starting to adapt it in May. So two weeks before you plan to plant, you need to put them outside where they get some filtered light. So we call that a sheltered location. So we have examples here of a sheltered location. We have Leah's well, window well from her basement for starting to adapt the plants. This is more for like your cool season crops or do you do your warm? That's cool season. Right, because it, it maintains, she's got the warmth of the house to kind of protect them and they are getting sun because this is facing what south, right? Yes. So it's, it's helping them adapt to the, you know, it's going to be really cold, some cold nights out there. It's going to get sun. It's not used to the sun. So two hours or so the first day and then increase. Uh, and if it's going to be really cold, bring them in at night. I, I, my setup is over on the right on the bottom and I have a porch. So when they're ready for some full sun, I can put them out to where they get some sun. So you can see some of those are getting full sun. Some of them are getting filtered sun. And I can move them around so that maybe they're only getting the sun in the morning and not the noontime sun that's blasting. And then you could also use something like the example on the lower left, which is a window with uh, over some straw bales and that is a protected area that you could use to help harden off your plants as well. And then once they're ready, so they're outside, they're getting some wind, they're getting some sun. So it's time to transplant and generally recommended wait till the more if you can the later afternoon or a cloudy day because you're going to be stressing them by taking them out of their container and disturbing the roots and getting them into the ground. So water them first because that will help prevent the stress. Plant on a, what we call a moderate day, not a burning hot day. If it's overcast, that's great or later in the afternoon. And then you may need to, to do some protection for them. If they're in the ground and the frost is coming, you can use um, the row cover type of protection. You can use milk jugs. Uh, I've even used an old sheet to just cover them. They give you a few degrees temperature protection. Uh, and then once they have established and they're growing, 
it, we say like around the first weeding that you would do of your garden, that's when you would want to put down some mulch like uh, straw or dried grass that hasn't seen any herbicide, something that you lay a, an inch away from around each plant. That way you reduce the chance of weeds, you help modulate the temperature of the soil and you help keep the moisture more even by having a mulch on top of that. Okay. There's a question, um, Sue, about uh, hardening off your plants mm -hmm. and um, bringing bugs back into your house. So um, I'm always afraid to bring plants out and then back in because I've ended up with small black gnats that then attack all of my house plants. So oh. are you concerned about bringing seedlings in and out of the house? No, I haven't had that with seedlings. And I'm wondering, is that that happens to me more when I'm putting my house plants out for the, you know, for the growing period, and and a lot of times with some moisture, it it's I seem to get those kinds of insects in my house plants. But I haven't gotten that. Have you gotten anything like that with uh, no. hardening off? Generally, generally I'm I'm hardening off so early in the season, even, even my tomatoes, I don't see a lot of insects, you know, I see the, the ground bees are up, <laughs> but I'm not seeing, you know, the, the insect pests are really start to get out there in July. That's, that's when you start, when I start seeing them. So I, yeah, I don't know, I'd have to see the, what kind of insect they were and, and what exactly they were doing to, to be able to advise better. Do you have any insight on that? No, I don't. Um, I don't, I've never had a problem with bringing in, and I have house plants and I've never had a problem and I've never even really considered, I've never even thought about it. And, you know, probably is something I should think about. Sometimes when I take my plants outside though, I have a screened porch so um, sometimes I'll harden them off in the screen, screen porch. I go like through a couple different stages of hardening off. That usually by the time I put them outside, there I don't. You're not bringing them back. A lot. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, on the thing about uh, there's another question about um, gnats, and I don't I don't have the answer because I don't know on house plants. Is do you have a recommendation for getting rid of gnats on house plants? Um, if you're seeing them actually on the plant, you know, the insecticidal soap uh, is, is generally recommended. It's not, not very harsh. Uh, sometimes, yeah, but a lot of times I think the gnats are in the soil, I, I think. Uh, if, if there's some way we can get your information, we can send you some uh, recommendations from extension because I know they have a lot on house plants and gnats, but I just don't have that in my head. And, so. and Dane has a question about planting seedlings indoors too early. Is there a harm in doing that? And I'd say it, there is. Um, I learned the hard way. I planted my tomatoes too early um, for a couple, several years and they got so long and just really tall and leggy. Um, and they were, you know, really ready to go out. Um, I don't know, Sue, if you've had any experiences of planting things too early um, indoors. Oh yeah, I've had them where they're busting out of the pots. And like, I, I, I do that, I tend to do that with squash and I have to be careful because then it stresses the squash plant to be in a small pot and it's getting really big. So I've got to water it and really baby it along. And uh, yeah, that's been, been my problem. Yeah, and you don't want to, I mean, ideally once a plant is growing, you don't want to stunt it. And if you've got it going too soon and it's getting too big, it's, it is going to get stunted in its growth stage. So, you know, you, you, you try, try not to do that. I mean, some years, it's happened because our, you know, we still have a frost and you, your plants are, were ready to go out by a frost date. And that frost date, we had one 
you know, later. So like you had to hold them for another week or two. I mean, it does happen. It's hard to plan it perfectly, but you know, I would try not to, I, I mean, I, I would kind of really stick with the package, the, the directions on the seedling packets. If it says to start six to eight weeks before last frost, I'd start that six to eight weeks before last frost. Yeah. Do you want me to go to the next slide too? We could just have that there. And then weren't you going to show something as well while they're thinking of more questions? Yeah, I'll. Um, you want me to stop sharing? Yes, please. Oh, good. Phew. <laughs> uh, if I can find it. Oh. Give me a second. Sorry about that. Um, what do you want me to do? I'm trying to get to that screen to share for the- Yeah, uh, see, it, the screen sharing is not exactly um, intuitive. So yeah, Nixa, if also, um, if you go to the uh, Kane uh, extension website, there is a Master Gardener help desk and you can send in an email question. So, uh, they have somebody that's answering emails all year long. So, There's oh yeah. Website, and I think Colleen has shared it with you in the chat and it might be in your email as well um, to the extension. And this is a nice um, spot for a lot of questions, whether it be aphids on your house plants or many number of things. If you scroll down, you'll see the help desk contact information. And um, normally we have a help desk uh, a physical president, a presence in St. Charles at the County Extension Office where you can walk in with questions. Um, with COVID and um, social distance restrictions, you know, we're not doing that right now. But we do have down here an email that you can send an email to, to our Extension Office with any questions, whether it be seedlings or other gardening, growing questions about trees or landscapes, aphids, pests. Um, you know, kind of keep this and handy and available so in the growing season if you do have questions you know if you start to see some disease you can send an email with questions about that but if you keep scrolling down um, you'll see local events and resources this gardener's corner is some nice reading for gardening um, and you'll find those those will get updated over time and then down here under the sherman garden community garden sherman garden is up in Elgin at, and it's affiliated with Sherman Hospital and uh, Master Gardeners are also affiliated with it. But they have phenomenal resources for gardening. If you click on this link here, um, hopefully this will work as we go live. Are you? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, so there's different tabs, diseases and pests, garden upkeep, getting started. So for example, under getting started, um, you know, this is um, I'm talking about companion planting, like what types of plants go really well together when you space them near each other. Um, so there's just a lot of, of um, really valuable resources out here on that under that Sherman Garden tab. So you can find that as a resource available. Right. And there's a growing vegetable chart that probably has some timing on that as well. So um look through i recommend you look through some of that yeah Here's that growing one vegetables isn't that one, the one that that it gives I, you soil temperatures yeah. uh-huh it tells you if it's a tender plant like um beans are tender so you wouldn't want to put them out in march but yeah lots of lots of good information so are there any questions before we wrap up or sign off? I see something in the chat. Oh, that's a thank you. Well, you know, remember that you can always contact Master Gardeners with any kind of gardening question. Uh, and we love to answer questions. So, you know, please feel free to do that. Um, I, something I failed to mention on seeds in the beginning, um, 
I don't know if you gardened last year, but the demand for seeds last year was like nothing we've ne ever seen before. When the pandemics hit, everybody wanted seeds. Seed houses, seed retailers were out. We had five times the demand for seed last year in 2020 um, because so many people were gardening. And they're anticipating, I'm hearing signs already that this year is gonna be the same. So don't, don't wait too long on your seed. Maybe try to start getting your seed you know, soon because I think um, you'll have a better chance of getting a broader assortment and selection. Okay, well, if there's no other questions, I think we'll end it there, but I just wanna say thank you so much. That was fantastic. I think we all learned a ton. Thank you. All right, well, we'll see yes. you. Yes. Have we'll a good growing here. season. We'll see you all in a month. Yep. <laughs> okay. All righty, so bye. bye. Good night. Thank you.